Bonjour, les 10 heures. Hello, it is uh, 10, we can now begin. Welcome to the third lecture. The third lecture is going to be dedicated to multi-scale modeling. Um, it's a bit of an impossible challenge to say that you can discuss that in one hour, um, in view of the fact that it's probably one of the major aspects of uh, material science developed over the past decade or so. And I think this could probably uh, be uh, the object of an entire uh, series of uh, lectures, seminars, and so on. So within this brief hour, I shall be asking you how I shall be uh, discussing how the question is posed, how it can be uh, used. There will be a detailed example um, by Marc Fievel in the seminar to tell you how multi-scale modeling can be done um, to assess uh, mechanical behaviors of materials in particular circumstances. And this afternoon's workshop will include a certain number of seminars around this uh, topic um, with varied speakers, and there will be one that will uh, discuss the, um, the genesis of microstructures. And these seminars will illustrate these topics. So my job this morning is to try to convince you uh, to attend the following seminars, but also to understand how material science, um, as I was saying in the inaugural uh, lecture, uh, is moving towards made-to-measure materials. So back to our uh, principles and uh, to our guiding thread that I showed you at the end of the inaugural lecture. We started by discussing architectured materials. We said it was a way of achieving uh, tailor-made materials and therefore needed to be selected carefully, which led us to the uh, lecture last week about uh, choice methods. And best choosing materials also means um, how you can change the materials modulus. And the idea of multi-scale modeling uh, that we're going to be discussing today is a certain number of tools that can help you to improve uh, the materials modulus. And next week, after discussing today how you can improve the material modulus, I shall, dis I shall say how they deteriorate questions of durability, why things don't always work as well as one would want to. So today we're going to be focusing on this idea of multi-scale modeling, um, which roughly is how do you go from the atom to the component. Uh, it's absolutely essential in material science for a very simple reason. What we're interested in are the properties, and what you want to control is the processes. And to pass from property to process, the rationale of material science is uh, says that one should master material microstructure. So the processes happen in meters or kilometers, very large scale microstructure is uh, micron uh, and below, even a nanometer or even smaller than that. So there's a large change of scale there. And the properties you're interested in, again, are interesting macroscopically. So you need to uh, move from microscopic to macroscopic. And when you want to try to have a a guide uh, for possible improvements, you need these modeling tools. So the change of scale is central to material science, and multi-scale modeling is a, a translation in terms of modeling tools of this central topic. So multi-scale means multi-scale in space, but also in time. Uh, typically, a certain number of properties that you're going to be examining are behavioral uh, over time in times that are much longer than the time in which you are testing, for instance. So you have a change in the time scale to help you understand how short tests um, can let you know how the material is going to behave in the long term. You also have uh, problems of time scale. Uh, you have modeling uh, time scale issues when the elementary mechanisms that are going to result in the emergence of a microstructure or the mobility of metals to create plasticity. Uh, in fact, these time scales are much shorter than the time you're going to be examining the material in. So you're going to have to change time scale and, and space scale, or, or perhaps even both. So why multi? I'm, I'm just talking about a change of scale. Why 
am I calling it multi? Here's a diagram where you have for various classes of materials, three great families. Um, you have scales of space uh, resulting in various um, microstructural features and the properties that go with them. And you can see that the scales of space go from things um, uh, things of in interatomic action, but when you're going to talk about rupture or breaking, um, you're at the scale of a micron or a dozen microns or so to understand the mic macroscopic behavior. So depending on the problem that you're examining, the microstructural characteristics that are relevant are not necessarily of the same scale. If you look at the, in terms of mechanical properties, the elasticity limit of a material, the microstructures of an alloy that are important are probably going to be a few, from a few nanometers to a few microns. Um, if you're talking about rupture, everything that's going to be happening at that scale can be condensed into a material behavior that will then be used to understand why a rupture occurs, why uh, cavities appear, and that's more um, a micron or, or a couple of microns. So when I talk about multi-scale modeling, quite clearly we are moving from the atom to the component, but we're not going to go through every step for every issue. Even if it would be a way of marketing multi-scale modeling, say I start with an atom and I build a nuclear power station, that's not the way things actually happen. Things are a little bit more subtle than that. So central to modern material science is the idea of having multi-scale modeling. So multi-scale modeling is a bit of a buzzword. It's all over the place and it's um, a pretty much everyone's holy grail and it's actually very amusing to see what people mean by that. This is what typically you will find uh, in people who do engineering design or process design. They're actually quite vague. And they say, oh well, they're very low scales, there's quantum mechanics, electrons, um, just put a box in there. And then as you add a certain number of boxes, people are going to be more precise about what they're really concerned with. So let's have a look at an example. This is the field of uh, um, uh, tarmac. You know, the hundreds of thousands of, ta of kilometers of tarmac on our roads and people are going to be asking uh, multi-scale modeling questions because what you want to know is how the tarmac can resist trucks and lorries, you need to understand how, it's a, a big problem because it's a problem of durability, how the uh, bitumen uh, gravel aggregates are going to work. You need to examine the uh, various phases in the bitumen that are going to appear. Um, the thermal processing, then you have all of the uh, bitumen's formulation in terms of chemistry. And what I'm showing you here is something that you could probably express in the same manner in more classic material science. Um, here, the concern, the multi-scale modeling concern here, is constant for all people who use materials. If we ju just look at another example here, um, we have people here talking about um, a spatial or multi-scale modeling for concrete, still civil engineering, and same kind of issues. We had people who made concrete, but also people who were working in geology. So to them, um, a multi-scale modeling starts in the quarry, the stone quarry. Um, you get some sand, you mix it with cement and so on to make concrete. Another example. This is multi-scale modeling from the point of view of people who were assessing uh, global warming, theories of uh, modeling the climate, not only the climate, but also uh, how it is connected with the behavior of an entire ecosystem. Uh, for instance, you could look here at, uh, this is the kind of diagram that you can find if you, if you search multi-scale modeling and process. 
So for each of these disciplines, you're always going to find a community um, of people who are in charge of multi-scale modeling. Usually the way it happens is that they focus on particular scales uh, for particular communities, which says that one scale that is relevant for one problem is not necessarily uh, uh, relevant um, at, on every level from the atom upward. So you can see it could take absolutely you know, terrifying proportions uh, if you look at petrochemicals because it finishes with a world map and the exchanges of flows between where you extract petroleum and where you use it uh, in uh, petrochemicals. So let's return to materials. This is something that people from the CEA will recognize. It's uh, almost the uh, standard now. It's uh, modeling uh, structured materials in nuclear power stations from the electron all the way, you don't start with the atom, you actually start with the electron, from the electron all the way to the, uh, um, to the uh, tank to allow us to understand the behavior, or the behavior of a material, not only the material you make the tank with, but also uh, the manner in which this material is going to behave uh, under the effects of radiation. I won't tell you, I won't go into details of that today because in the materials in extreme conditions seminar, that will be one of our case studies. So in this particular diagram, you have the time scale that goes from the picosecond to uh, the uh, hundreds of years. In fact, uh, for structures, it's okay, but for fuels, for instance, and waste, uh, the time scale is probably more like hundreds of thousands of years. So you do need to have a time scale. It's very rare to have tests that last 100,000 years. But basically, uh, and in terms of space, it goes basically to a scale of around one meter. And what this key diagram says that based on uh, the electronic structures, I need to understand what are the connecting forces uh, between the atoms, the way in which the atoms are distributed, the phases that are going to appear, I'm going to try and understand how they interact with vectors of plasticity, which tells me that what's happening in a grain, um, what a grain uh, doesn't deform in the same way according to its uh, crystal uh, orientation. So I need an additional step, which is uh, how does a polycrystal behave if I know how a monocrystal behaves? And then after all of that, you need to say that you have a behavioral law which you can then superimpose onto a structure which is not solicited homogeneously and you can ultimately hope uh, to find out how a structure responds to stress, temperature and so on. And ideally when you're trying to sell this to um, an agency you can say I can optimize um, uh, things towards the top here. Problem is that's not true. Even that's sort of a realistic um, target um, there are all sorts of building blocks that are missing, but in a sense, uh, the benefit of this type of process is that it gives you a kind of um, reading, a grid, a kind of guiding line that says, this is my objective and these are the different steps I'm going to need to uh, go through. So when you look at this, you will see that I haven't talked at all about the fact that the, the structure becomes more fragile under the effects of radiation. If I, and then I also need to know what are the defects or flaws in the structure. See, it says nowhere here inclusion. Inclusions come from the process. It says nowhere uh, that there's a relationship between the uh, forging, uh, for instance, um, of the uh, tank and uh, the various segregations that can happen during that process. So. Basically, this gives you the target, but it needs to have many more, more precise steps and multi-scale modeling is not the most, the only thing you need to do. You need, you can use it to connect other aspects that need to be built on. Um, but the, the connection between precipitation and elasticity limit is something that we're quite familiar with. The relationship between microstructure and uh, 
and materials something that is not so well known. The relationship between microstructure and fatigue is something uh, which is essentially empirical. So the elementary building blocks are not all there. I think it's very important to never forget that. But it does tell us which elementary bricks we should be building on. So I've just given you a, a kind of overview of the issue, and I shall now try to examine questions. This is one of the um, multiple possible versions of, the, of a diagram of multi-scale uh, modeling for some mechanical properties, and more precisely here, a property which is uh, essentially the elasticity limit. And one way of obtaining that is the dynamics of uh, structure dislocation. It's a diagram by David Rodney, and Marc Fivel's um, presentation will be uh, much more detailed in the following seminar. So what you have here are a time and space scales. Um, the space scale goes from the atom with analysis of electronic uh, structures. I'm going to give you an idea of the cohesiveness of the atoms, interactions between the um, default dislocations on the interactions of the dislocations um, among themselves. And essentially what we're going to be looking at is what is going to be happening inside the grains. And then you have different time scales. Uh, you have a very brief time scales. You can move on to higher scales when you're talking about the uh, dynamics of dislocation. You can also um, talk about um, greater uh, spatial uh, intervals because when you're talking about dislocation because your scale is the grain and so on. So if you take about 100,000 objects, you have 100,000 times the size of the object. It gives you basically the size of the system that you can simulate. So what are the interrogations here? There are questions of coupling between the various scales. So of course you can um, develop various scales of simulation, but then and then see how you can couple them. So you can have coupling methods between uh, multi-scale in time. Some people have tried to do it. Um, there's quite an impetus to do that, moving from the atom to the perfect crystal, entering the dislocation in the perfect crystal, see how the dislocations interact, and so on. That's uh, a coupling in space. And then you have coupling in time from the atomic vibration to and time scales, which are the duration of a mechanical care test, a thermal processing. And this vertical transition is actually much more difficult because it's uh, not very clear um, how you can average a time scale um, and move on to the um, greater time scale. And very often, you need to transition diagonally to have both increasing space and time scales. So one example that will be discussed um, in more detail this afternoon in the seminar, we'll discuss the uh, collective behavior of defaults and how the plasticity of materials can be understood. And the first seminar this afternoon is Emmanuel Clouet, who's going to tell us about how you can have a change of time and uh, space scale for microstructures. This is the uh, size of the precipitate to understand how a uh, thermal process, uh, I put all of the atoms in solution, um, I hope that entropy is going to play, and then I dip the alloy to place it in a stable state. And in this metastable uh, state, I agglomerate on the atoms, make precipitates of, of given size. It's very important to understand the consequences on the properties. And that size um, is actually going to change in terms of the thermal history they experience, uh, time, temperature, uh, multi-threshold treatments, um, to see how it can be industrialized. So you have various timescales here.
with uh, Monte Carlo kinetic simulations, a uh, cluster dynamic simulations. So you can see how one can feed upon the other and how this can um, actually be moved on to greater uh, scales. You have a little bit of a million seconds here and you'd actually like to know um, how this would uh, be reflected in the space of a couple of hours, for instance. So these are continuous models, but they can be connected to microstructural, to atomistic uh, aspects. So these are pretty diagrams that we're going to be discussing, and I actually think this is very important. Um, it's something that is adequately analyzed on reasonably simple alloys. If you take an industrial alloy, this, we're talking about technological innovation here, so we have to say, we have to talk about materials that are used in real life. In fact, you can have an alloy with half of Mendeleev's table, and you're not going to have an ab initio calculation based on that. So basically, what you're going to be learning about simple systems, uh, you're going to be wondering how it can be adapted to systems that are more relevant in terms of industrial applications. I think that is probably an important point. Marc will tell you more about this one. Um, nano indentation test from the atomic to the uh, finished elements. So let us now return to this issue I wanted to discuss today. Um, I think it's a, it's a recurrent, a recurring problem um, about multi-scale modeling in a context that goes all the way to the development of materials, a more technological approach. Um, essentially, when you obtain experimental results on a microstructure, mechanical behavior, and so on, most of the time in an industrial environment, you have results on materials that you intend to actually use, materials that I would call realistic. So. A huge source of results is the qualification of the materials. You use materials, and in order to do so, you qualify them. Uh, you examine uh, the state of precipitation, precipitation after various uh, thermal treatments. Um, you see uh, what the macroscopic effects are on the material's behavior. So what you're trying to do um, with multi-scale modeling is usually much more something that you're doing on model materials. Uh, when you want to calculate ab initio all the way to uh, Monte Carlo dynamics to obtain precipitation, usually you're going to be working on binary or, or tertiary alloys, but probably not that alloy with half of Mendeleev table in it. Uh, Marc Fivel will show you, uh, will tell you about methods of digital simulation of dislocation dynamics. But initially, this was developed on materials that were extremely simple. Um, copper, um, which is a metal that we know lots of things about. We don't know everything about copper, but we know lots. So when you're modeling, the justice of the piece here, in a sense, is always the experience between, ex always the comparison between experience and modeling. So basically, you're modeling simplified systems, and you compare that um, uh, versus model systems. So what you're looking for is to see how you can understand or even predict the behavior of more complex systems. So how do you achieve that? These are the different steps. If you obtain experimental results on realistic materials, Look at an elasticity limit uh, versus a thermal treatment, for instance, temperature treatment. You're really going to have a back of the envelope uh, calculations, as it were, to identify the dominant mechanisms, the relevant variables. Um, for the elasticity, the relevant variable here is the size of the precipitation. And, the, and what I said uh, in terms of rupture, what was essential are uh, scales they're much greater than for uh, elasticity, although the inclusions may have absorbed some of the solution, which is no longer in its precipitate uh, state. So these back-of-the-envelope models can actually help you to see which uh, uh, scales are important for a particular issue. So you have simpl simplified systems where you're going to have physically-based simulations. You're going to try to apply your multi-scale modeling.
and then you're going to validate the models with experimental systems that are designed specifically for that. Uh, people have said a lot of things about multi-scale modeling by saying that it's going to require less uh, experimentation. No, it doesn't. It makes you make your experiments differently, not less. Because you can only have confidence in the simulation tool if you have experimented with systems selected to be relevant to uh, make the simulation tool more trustworthy. So there's a validation step here, validation of the model. And the model must be validated with experimental uh, systems that have the same degree of simplification than what you did to actually construct the model. Let me explain. If you take a model that has the ability to give you the elasticity limit based on an alloy's state of precipitation, and that you've done that uh, for a system where your uh, precipitates are uh, diluted or are perfectly uh, consistent with the matrix, so you take any realistic system, um, uh, there are uh, great chances that this is actually not true. So if you compare your simulation with a realist system without having the validation step, there are two solutions. You have the Damar theorem. Uh, give me 100 parameters, I'll make an elephant. Give me 101, I'll make him twitch his tail. Or, or you can do things seriously. If it doesn't work, you will never know whether your simulation is not relevant because it's inconsistent or whether it's not relevant because the simplifications in your model are not admissible for the system uh, with which you're comparing it. So. When you're simulating on a simplified system, you must always, on the opposite side, have something that's simplified experimentally that you can compare it with in order to be sure that the model you've made is relevant in view of the simplifications you've operated. And then say, are these simplifications, what is the limit of applicability for a given industrial system? So. Let's imagine that you have compared your model, say your precipitation model that Ivan Manuel Clouet is going to tell you about. You've compared it to an aluminium lithium or aluminium zircon or aluminium scandium uh, system where your hypotheses are relevant. You validated the model in a sense, and then you're going to say, how can we have back of the envelope models again to see how you can adapt the simplified model? in order to try and address more complex issues. Um, if we look at what Marc Fivelle is going to tell us about, well calibrated with copper, with 40 years of experience in copper, uh, fundamentally, if you want to apply it to a stainless steel 316 alloy, how do you move from, um, how do you move from copper to this uh, stainless steel alloy? So you have a the distance of dislocations between copper, how does that need to be modified in order to fit the uh, distance in stainless steel at the temperature in which I'm going to be studying it? And then, once you've done that, it will be relevant to say that you're going to try to compare your simulation with experimental results on a realistic system. Example, if I take the physics of the plasticity of metals and alloys, the back of the envelope model, it's a pretty big envelope though, because um, you're using all the entire theory of dislocation, which could be quite thick, obviously. Um, you're going to try to uh, build your model. Your model uh, will exist in several scales. You can have an atomistic, um, analysis, a mesoscopic, um, that of the behavior of a crystal or a polycrystal, and you validate these models with your uh, digital uh, simulations with existing literature about copper. So you're going to be calibrating a multi scale plasticity model on results on. Uh, copper monocrystals and construct a simulation which you will then compare to results on the plastic and elastic properties of a copper crystal solicited in various directions. 
Uh, you can have several uh, sliding systems that are activating and so on and so forth. Then you have your back of the envelope model uh, to say how should the uh, annihilation uh, or deviated distance uh, be uh, modified when moving from copper to uh, uh, steel uh, 316L. You can always think that, for instance, dislocation occurs when they're sufficiently close and you uh, build a model where you say that there's an interaction force that's um, um, in inversely proportional to the creation of distance in order to create the defects. What you do is that you check that your analysis allows you to understand what's happening in copper. And if you can do that, it should probably work properly on 316 steel. So I think it's important to really bear that in mind because I I think, in a sense, people were fascinated by multi-scale simulations. Um, they're a good thing, of course, very interesting, but people tended to forget that it's desirable alongside a simulation to have an experimental validation program on model materials which are chosen not just in terms of their use but in terms of their relevance. Um, um, in view of the simplifications used uh, from, to create the model. And it's only if you do that that multi-scale modeling can be useful for real uh, materials. So if I look at this diagram a little bit more, uh, here you have a typical um, aspect where multi-scale um, is essential um, because uh, if you look at a radioactive material, all of the effects happen on microscopic levels because of radiation and the damage occurs macroscopically. So the simulation of sort of molecular dynamics and that has a certain number of requirements. When you want to do molecular dynamics on a, a population of atoms, you don't merely need to know uh, the interaction between atoms. You also need to know the entire interaction force between the atoms. So what you're going to do is irradiate uh, the material or, you know, uh, bang him in the face with a whole bu a bunch of neutrons. These defects are going to recondense, recombine, and then after 10.3 uh, picoseconds, which is uh, actually um, not quite as long as the lifespan of a nuclear power station. Uh, and this gives you uh, an entry point into the understanding of the behavioral materials uh, affected uh, by radiation. So if you're doing that with um, a couple of hundred thousand atoms, that is not your uh, power station tank. You're going to need to say these irradiation floors, which I've created, are going to allow me to examine a state of precipitation, um, either under the effects of radiation or just because I changed the temperature. And you can also have condensation of these uh, radiation effects with loops. Uh, they're going to lead to hardening of the material and so on and so forth. So this particular image here is not behavior under the effects of radiation but under uh, thermal uh, treatment because we're actually in a situation, or at least we have been, for actually less than a decade that's quite unique in the field of material science. We have developed exactly on the same level of scale digital modeling and experimental observation. What you have at the right here is um, something where you count atoms one by one on a scale where you're actually simulating their behavior. And this is something that is really consistent with what I was saying earlier. It's the ideal situation. You need an experimental program with the right materials uh, that have the uh, same degree of simplification. but you must also have the experimental procedures to yield the information you're looking for. And this is an instance where it's possible. Um, there are plenty of other cases where you can't. But uh, multi-scale simulation tends to be suspended sort of in, in the limbo um, without um, reflecting reality uh, very much. So if I look at a typical case here, um, we have a certain number of faults. We're trying to see how, if there are dynamics of uh, accumulation of these faults. 
and express them in terms of loops, uh, lax, uh, in interstitial uh, flaws, and the consequence of these flaws on the uh, material's elasticity limit. Now these uh, free dislocations are going to articulate with the flaws I've tried to create. So we're no longer working in molecular dynamics here. The uh, time and space is no longer adapted. You, because you can say how many flaws, uh, defaults, defects you're going to be creating, and you're going to integrate that and say this uh, population of defects, uh, how do they interact? How can a lack be absorbed by a loop that's already there or an interstitial loop? So you can see how your population of uh, default of uh, uh, defect agglomerations um, what could they be? They can be sort of cavities. So all of the ingredients that you can kind of include into that, and they're going to tell you what changes over time they're going to be to the obstacles to this dislocation movement that you're going to reflect by the change over time of the behavior of these dislocations when you're trying to move them. Now, these are things that we will be examining in a seminar dedicated to that in what I call um, what I called materials in extreme conditions. Oh well, it's stuck. How strange. Oh, everything's stuck. So there, I was just telling you about cases where uh, the thing seemed to work, but I've swept under the carpet the fact that you need a whole lot of experimental data, some of which needs to be estimated. Now, if I can just move backwards, this is a case, the case of a cluster dynamics model in the formation of uh, and gaps, and uh, it was a recent thesis in material uh, affected uh, to radiation. Um, this was an experimentation done with Areva, and we have um, the manner of which we, in the manner in which we can describe uh, the various parameters. So here, the trick is not to say I know all. The trick is to say that there are some that I can measure some that I can estimate, surface energy, interface energy. We know it's probably uh, a couple of hundred uh, millijoules uh, per um, a given surface. So there's some parameters you know how to measure, some that you know how to estimate, and those that are constant. And uh, you need to minimize the number of param parameters that you do not know. So a, a model is honest when it uh, does not claim that there are no adjustable parameters, because that uh, can hardly be true, but to try to maximize with parameters that are either measurable or that can be estimated. So let me show you an example which I think is very interesting. There will be a certain number of seminars next week about um, durability of materials. Um, this is a case where you can really feel the usefulness of multi-scale modeling, but it hasn't been done. The elemental building blocks are being constructed, but basically um, it needs uh, uh, to be done. And here it's the multi-scale modeling of corrosion, which is interesting because, of course, we want to know how long we can leave uh, something uh, exposed before it thins too much, before it cracks. Um, we need very well know that things can be done on the atomic level. If you look at the oxidation of nickel, for instance, uh, you can calculate on the atomistic level the way in which nickel oxidizes, meaning that you need to have the um, you need to have a clear understanding of the uh, interaction of atoms in the surface uh, versus the volume, which is not that easy. And then what you may want to try to do is to couple that with what's going to be happening on a slightly higher level. 
If you take corrosion more than oxidation, for instance, the question will be, uh, what do I do? A, a grain joint? What's the electrochemical current that there can be between that and the inside of and the inside of the grain? And gradually, step by step, to construct. Uh, find the various building blocks that are going to tell you whether such or such an al alloy, such or such size grain, temperature, environment, um, these are the circumstances in when it's, it's going to be corroding. And we're actually light years away from this type of result. I think we're just uh, pretty much at the step of the elemental modeling. And you can only chain uh, different bricks together if you've obtained the bricks, and we still haven't. Let me give you three examples now of multi-scale modeling. The first example is simulation of solidification structures. This is something that started in the Federal Polytechnic School of Lausanne, Switzerland, quite a while ago, but which has grown and allowed us to um, envisage technologically important issues such as how can you have a controlled growth of a uh, monocrystalline uh, turbine when you solidify an alloy? Uh, when you're solidifying an alloy, usually you have a polycrystal. Um, for reasons of use in very high uh, temperature, you want to have uh, monocrystal uh, uh, parts. And I told you in the inaugural uh, lecture that um, uh, part of that turbine is going to have a quite a, a, a convoluted shape with holes in it to assemble it and, and surface treatments. It's actually a real object. It's not just something that uh, this uh, monocrystalline uh, part. So you're going to move from solidification all the way to a place where you're going to just have one single grain. So the fun thing is that you have uh, about uh, about the solids of, of liquids that become solids with lots of grains that are oriented differently. And you pass that through a kind of uh, a tunnel. And it's just going to extract one grain that's going to solidify, um, meaning that you you need to predict the orientation of the grains you're going to have in the solidification process and how the thermics and uh, the cooling around that is a bit like a, a corkscrew spiral, and how that can actually encourage a microcrystalline orientation rather than another, which can actually lead you to think to think about what is the cooling uh, process, um, how many uh, bends in the tunnel, and so on. So this was done in Lausanne probably around 15 years ago. Um, it's something that's um, actually developed quite extensively, and it was done on simple systems, so you could understand something. Here are the various scales that are going to be examined. Charles-André Grandin uh, gave me this slide. In terms of modeling, you can think about modeling on the, at the interface between liquid and solid the dendritic uh, diagram, and then the modeling of grains. And very often you're going to be focusing on such or such an aspect of the modeling. Let me show you how you can address a multi-scale uh, modeling issue. Um, so forget the atoms, but uh, look at how you can solidify a liquid uh, within a given thermal, um, thermal history. Um, What's difficult is that when you solidify from liquid to solid, um, there's a heat exchange. The uh, thermal field in which your solid is going to so your liquid liquid is going to solidify is something that's connected to what you're applying from outside macroscop macroscopically, how you're pumping the uh, heat, but also the way in which you solidify. And the more you can have a heat exchange between liquid and solid. And that heat exchange uh, comes from a, a heat source that's going to diffuse across the liquid. And the way it's diffused in the liquid can also uh, be related to the way the liquid is moving. 
So you need to be able to couple something that's very, very microscopic. What is the germ that's going to appear? What's the speed? What's the orientation? What's the growth speed? That is what is going to give you both the grain, but also the internal heat source in your solidification process. And you need to couple that with something that's very macroscopic, which is the thermal field in which solidification is occurring. Just one little trick, which is actually reusable, is to say that the thermal field um, can be seen continuously. And some things work well where well. you have Fourier equations, Nanning's Oaks for liquids, and you can build continuous models to tell you how uh, heat is distributed. But the thermal source in your problem is something that's connected to transformation phase itself. So Michel Rapaz's trick was to say, OK, I'm going to have my thermal field uh, calculation with uh, uh, finished elements, and I'm going to set simple rules with a cellular autom or, uh, automation system. I'm going to have a mesh within each mesh of my f finite element, and a small element of volu uh, volume which is either solid or liquid, and I'll um, set a certain number of criteria from moving uh, from liquid to solid, either because next to him he had a solid that has invaded him, or he's liquid turning into solid because there's a germination process. So here, the, the rationale of uh, the simulation is typically the cellular uh, the automaton, where it uh, its state changes based on its neighborhood, either its immediate neighborhood, solid or liquid, or the continuous neighborhood, which is the thermal field. So. And that's one of the little tricks that, of course, that said, um, that's only part of the story because you can sense that uh, the problem is what is my cellular, uh, auto my automated cellular uh, thing going to use as criteria? And I need, therefore, to use the knowledge of liquid solid germination because, of course, it depends very much on the temperature where it occurs. Um, it depends on because um, there's uh, germination and then there's growth. Another important aspect, I think you may be under the impression the only place that there's a problem is microscopically, but macroscopically it hurts too. If you want to look at a realistic problem, the flow of fluid is not just that. It's a fluid in an environment that is partly solid. So if you want to write your transport, your fluid transport equations, there is going to be fluid transport, of course, because there's a change of mass of the entire system. So there are going to be pressure fields developing. And that requires permeability of the environment. And permeability of the environment um, is required because, of course, you're not going to have a fluid mechanics with a real dendrite geography. It would be a nightmare. You can do it for one or two dendrites but not for an entire turbine part. So you need to have a transport equations for the fluid that are going to um, result in permeability. And you're going to need to have a model that connects permeability of the material, the way in which a liquid flows under a pressure gradient, permeability of the material, um, at the microstructural state, the size you have, and so on and so forth. So you can see how you can connect two scales that are forced to coexist. And I've shown in this example where the blocks, the blocking points are. And that kind of thing allows you to, for instance, uh, model the uh, columnary equiaxis uh, uh, transition, for instance. What I've just described has been used uh, with many alloys, many configurations, many geometries. It's a principle that's fully functional now to control uh, solidification microstructures. So second example now of multi-scale modeling. Um, it's uh, an example that comes uh, from the nuclear industry, but not in the operation of nuclear power stations, but in what do you do with spent fuel? So the fuel um, is in a kind of tube of zircon alloy, and when you've when the, the fuel is spent, when you want to stop using it as a fuel, 
before um, it goes through its sleeve. Of course, there's a, a, a time limit. And then you have this uh, fuel rod, which you're going to need to take to its storage place, its place of storage. And transporting it means that inside that you have a fuel that is emitting gas and therefore creating pressure, meaning that there are going to be constraints on the, on the sheath. And then, of course, all of that's very hot, meaning that the thermal solicitation is going to be a constraint. There's going to be physical constraint and a temperature. And when you increase temperature and constraint, there's going to be plastic deformation that is uh, known as creep. And there's an additional difficulty. Uh, it's that uh, materials have been irradiated, deformed, and that they're liable to be subjected to recrystallization, meaning that the fact that they have many, many uh, faults uh, when you heat something and want to get rid of something and to get rid of the dislocation, either you heat it up slowly, which is called restoration, or you do it brutally, uh, creating new grains that no longer contain uh, the faults. That's recrystallization. Um, this creates a funny uh, solution because you have this material that is, has become deformed, um, has a, a thermal history that is going to result um, in a response in terms of deformation, but also in terms of microstructure. When you have this uh, response in terms of microstructure, you have a material where the grains are full of faults and they have a, a given crystalline orientation. And when you recrystallize, you have crystals that are softer and with another orientation. All of this doesn't happen all in one go. You have some grains that are recrystallized, some others that have not. And that means that you need to understand um, um, how uh, things uh, move um, when you transport it, before you put it in, into a pool, before you chop it up into little bits and process the nuclear waste. But the behavior is going to depend, is going to change, because there's going to be recrystallization that's going to change the crystalline texture and therefore the material's meso mesotropy. So you cannot understand the macroscopic behavior without understanding mesoscopically how the granular structure is going to move how the faults are going to change. So the entire recrystallization process. What we're actually discussing right now is the fact that we're working on a kind of evolving composite. You have the hard area, the soft area, the crystallography is changing, and all of that is being solicited by a constraint. So recrystallization. Let's take an example. That means that you need to move to a slightly lower scale. You have recrystallization is one grain, several grains with no faults that are growing uh, to the expense of a matrix that is full of faults. What's easy to understand is the growth of a new grain. Well, what's not so easy to understand is the germination of uh, that, uh, which is bringing you to germination criteria uh, involving the stability of the dislo dislocation structure you have within the uh, material uh, that you're processing to a thermal treatment. I won't go into the very fine details of this, but for this question that's essentially a question of change of scale, you don't always have to use simulation. You can perfectly well answer these questions with an analytical or semi-analytical um, approach. So here the semi-analytical approach would be in this instance here to say how is a new grain going to germinate during recrystallization? You need to see what energy is stored, how um, uh, is that going to happen because there are law laws of uh, restoration, how the uh, subgrain structure is going to change, how you can obtain a bare uh, zone that is going to grow within the deformed material. That usually occurs at the uh, grain connection. It's the Bailey-Hirsch criterion that's used there. And you're going to find out the uh, change uh, kinetics of uh, uncrystallized or crystallized. 
but that's only part of the story because zircon is a mesotropic material. There's a texture that's a deformation texture and a texture that's a recrystallization texture, meaning that you need to be able to index each of the grains and say, okay, they're appearing with such or such an orientation. And once you've done that, you have a polycrystalline problem, a distribution of textures. So make, you can make life easier by saying I have two uh, components of textures, but also a composite problem, because you have one texture that's much harder than the other, not only from a crystalline point of view, but also because it still has a lot of faults. So all of this is going to allow you to obtain a tool describing change in the microstructure under constraint and uh, with a thermal history. Third example I wanted to discuss. Um, all the details of these various steps will be on the uh, slides, but I'd prefer to tell you about this third example, which is um, a manner of looping the loop of change of scale with another issue, which is not a, a metallurgy a question nor a material science question. But the reason I wanted to give you this example is to show you how something derived from material science can help you to examine other classes of issues. Here, it's the problem of cell adhesion on a live, on an inert substrate. How do existing tools from material science, how can these tools help to understand things better when you're actually dis detaching a cell from a substrate? And our Belgian friends who are in this room um, will be happy to know to understand that this was uh, done to understand how a vats, um, uh, how beer uh, producing vats in breweries could be cleaned um, with the adhesion of yeast onto the onto the vat. So here, in fact, a modeling on several scales is simply not moving from the microscopic to know what's going to happen at the macroscopic level, but you can also leave from the macroscopic level to identify uh, microscopic information that you could not be obtained otherwise. So we're going to see how cells become detached and with a simple model to understand how these cells become detached, how can you access the adhesion, the activation energy, uh, essentially the way in which the proteins, the membrane proteins of the cell allow it to become attached to a substrate and how that changes when you change the state of the substrate. Just a, a very brief outline of the approach, of course, because it's also a manner of uh, telling you that having a materials point of view from a no, on a non-materials issue can be interesting. So this is uh, the experience, a bit like um, what you do is you take a plate, take a glass plate, pretty good because you can see what's happening through it. You're going to spray water onto it it's going to splash, you let it flow. So in fact what you do is you inject water between two plates and you have a, a poiseuille flow and you know everywhere how uh, the uh, fluid is behaving and the cells that are going to be deposited on the substrate in every part of the substrate of the glass is uh, going to be uh, sheared by the fluid. If you know the size of the cell, if you know how the speed of the fluid, you can uh, quite um, quickly evaluate uh, the force applied to it. So when you're looking at that, with a given image, you have the cells that are there for a given time. So you can look in terms of the constraint the cells are subjected to, how long it's going to take for them to detach. That's what I call a scientific dishwashing and it's going to allow you to find out the kinetics uh, very quickly. So when you carry that out it's actually not a very difficult experience. You need to make sure that temperature remains constant at 25 degrees Celsius but let's just go directly to this one now. You can look at the constraint at a given point how many cells remain uh, at a given time. Uh, this is the you can see that the percentage of remaining cells um, is actually quite systematic. You detach, then you saturate up to a certain point. Then, of course, 
the more water you're ascending in your kind of experimental dishwasher, the more it's going to clean cells off. Um, what's interesting is that it's incredibly reproducible. I thought, oh dear, this is um, biological, it's going to be very complex. But it's actually perfectly reproducible for a whole population of cells. So the uh, detachment has a certain kinetics and a certain level of efficacy. So this can be bottled like this. It's actually quite simple. Basically what you're doing is that it's kinetics of the first order. You're only detaching cells that are still attached, of course. So the, you have a characteristic time, characteristic frequency of detachment that depends on the constraint. Um, what you need to do is to understand what the graph here is, because you have the theoretical graph here and the experimental graph. And in order to understand this properly, um, com completely uh, phenomenologically, you need to understand the constraint here, a uh, base on uh, the constraint. And in fact, this has valid uh, physics, uh, microscopic physics reasons to um, result in this. Um, if you have a cell that you're peeling off, essentially it's um, a sac, and this sac is connected by a certain number of springs. Uh, they have all sorts of complicated names for those springs. Uh, basically, they create links between the sac and uh, the substrate. And you can see here that if you move along too much, you can't extend the spring long enough to attach the substrate. If you're here, you're fine, because none of the springs is really um, tense. So you, you can actually go uh, further and try to assess the efficiency of peeling. And when something is very simple, you're going to say that essentially the efficiency of peeling shows that it follows this um, F function. Um, if you look at the size of the cells, it follows uh, normal laws. I don't know why, but um, that's the case. Uh, look at how you can detach a cell. If you have this critical constraint um, that is the uh, maximum extension that you can do for each of the links between cell and substrate, and you say, okay, I've got a big cell, small cell, uh, the shearing is, um, caused by the fluid is going to be different. But in fact, the critical constraint you're going to be applying, if you set yourself a critical constraint, it depends, of course, on the size of the cells in a very simple way of doing that is to have a balance equation between force applied by this uh, Poisson flow and a force applied by the links here. And what you can show is that the critical constraint for the flow, for the peeling, is going to be the reverse of the uh, cells cubed because as the distribution law is normal and the, the flow uh, the detachment constraint is a function, so the power of the size of the cells, it means that you're probably also going to have a normal law. And you're naturally going to obtain the frequency of those that are appealed by uh, having these thresholds of uh, peeling, which is how you end up with this function, which is mainly a reflection that the distribution in size is normal is a log normal and that it's a function of the cell size. So we haven't done a lot of uh, uh, physics and chemistry here, but basically cells love to adhere to the surface. They need to stretch these little links, these bonds, and that's going to cost energy. And when you apply a constraint, what you're doing is that you're modifying the balance between links that are attached, bonds that are attached, and those that are not. So chemists have actually worked on this for us, and we'll see how. If you look at this bond here, and you see that it's one is stretched and one is not stretched, you have a kind of stiffness constant, uh, and, and you're pulling on them. And all that you're saying here is that there are two states for this particular system. You have a detached uh, system and an attached 
system, and you have a difference between those. Uh, you have a certain frequency um, to uh, go through that uh, threshold. Anyone who's worked on this has seen this diagram. So basically, we're just recycling this idea and saying that if you start to apply a constraint on that system, if you are starting to detach the cell, you're basically working on that system. You're just modifying the balance between attached and detached by applying a constraint. So you're changing the population flows uh, between the links that are attached and those that are not. So what you need to do now is to look at how a population is moving this way or that way. It's K on and K off how you can bias that by applying a constraint. So when you have the mechanics of that, just um, a bit of algebra here that's um, actually quite common when you're working on uh, reactional mechanisms, um, you reach the following conclusion. You have a cell here uh, with um, an addition bond here. This area here is a balance between the force you're applying and the bonds you're forming. So if you apply a sufficiently high force, the adherence area that is supposed to balance that is actually forcing you to stretch the bonds more than they can withstand. And that is going to create a connection between the size of the adherence, the contact surface, the intrinsic curve of the cells, and the force that you're applying from without. Once you have that, you have all of the ingredients to a model adhesion. And what I wanted to show you uh, to finish, because I've already um, been too long, is a law between the peeling speed and the force applied. And that can be calculated like this. You can have confocal microscopy to simply look at one cell, and you can see the speed at which it peels. Here you have the experimental points, and you have the theoretical law here that looks uh, pretty much like this. You have the experimental points here based on the constraint. So what you obtain ultimately, you have the various macroscopic orders here. You have distribution of uh, efficiency that translates the size of the cells that translates into thresholds of uh, peeling. You have a peeling kinetics that appears here, and you have a relationship between the efficiency and the kinetics, which can be directly linked to the energy of the bonds that you're forming uh, between uh, bonds that are formed and bonds that are not formed. So if you look at this law here, you can verify it. You can have a measure of the adherence energy, and you can see how the bond energy is modified by the fact that you have or not had thermal processing of your glass plate or your piece of steel. So the conclusions of uh, this lecture. Why do we use multi-scale modeling? What is the link between experimentation and multi-scale modeling in terms of validation? And I've tried to show you a couple of examples where we can see how a change of scale, and sometimes it's multi-scale, sometimes only two scales. There are situations where you tend to do things, simu digital simulation or analytical. Um, so model multi-scale modeling, what for? Of course, um, the, the, the selling point, as it were, for multi-scale model, modeling is that you're trying to predict macroscopic or long-term behavior from microscopics and short-term uh, information. But you can do that the other way. You can use macroscopic observation to understand the microscopic origins of a given phenomenon. So the delta G that we saw in adherence, in adhesion, is in the order um, and, and it's also connected to the fact that there has been such or such a chemical or thermal treatment of the surface. So what are the open issues that remain, which come back again and again, not only in material science, but in all of the fields where multi-scale modeling is used? I'll give you a few examples, but um, it's done in um, fluid mechanics, in, in uh, neutronics, and systematically, 
there's the uh, the issue of the robustness of the building blocks arises. It's never a given. The types of couplings between scales. Am I translating into a greater scale from the lower scale, or am I integrating uh, the model? The uh, reverse methods. There are many methods, many instances where you have data that you do not know and which you obtain with reverse methods. Uh, we do that very often with finished elements. How can you do that in a structured and reliable way when you're working with a whole set of codes um, to create multi-scale modeling? Another essential issue that one needs to uh, question uh, across many fields in neutronics, uh, materials, uh, uh, fluid mechanics is propagation of errors. Where does that come from? What is the precision at which you need to have the entry data to obtain um, adequate output data? Is the error in each of the blocks or just in the passing of information from one block to another? And that poses real questions, not only of physics or, or physics chemistry, but also of applied math. Um, and then that brings me back to a truly essential point is how do you design a dedicated experimental program to uh, design multi-scale model modeling? I'd like to thank you for your attention. Now yield the floor to Marc Fivel for the seminar, who's going to give you an example of multi-scale modeling in plastic properties of materials. Just one thing, again, um, as before, the lecture is followed by a seminar and this afternoon a set of presentations and you're of course most welcome to attend if you so wish um, about examples of uh, multi-scale modeling.